pray. Lord, what a great privilege it is to join our voices together in a foretaste of a heavenly song, to sing your praises, to reflect on your mercies, to revel in forgiveness of sin and access to you. God, we deserve none of these things. And by your program, your plan, we get to gather every week to sit under your word, to have our thoughts and hearts recalibrated, to gather together with your people, to have our affections renewed, to be encouraged, and to worship you together. These inestimable privileges are all by your grace, all of your kindness. And we pray that we'd be humbled this morning again by your kindness, by your love, by your grace and your mercy. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 11, continuing our study of Romans. And as we've made our way through the book of Romans, we haven't come across very many commands. There have not been very many statements in this letter so far that have told us what to do. We've been neck deep in doctrine, lofty thoughts about God, right thinking about man and sin and salvation. Up to this point, the Apostle Paul has been detailing the reality of how sinners are made right with a holy God, or how God can forgive sin and still maintain his reputation as just or even how we could enjoy the glory of God rather than being incinerated by it one day. And all of this is rooted in God's saving work through Jesus Christ. But we haven't had a lot of statements about what to do with all of these things. We're about to turn the corner in Romans 12 to a list of therefore statements do this, don't do this. In view of the mercies of God, here is how the Christian life is to be lived. But what's striking in this section of Romans 11, we are inching toward this great doxological climax that the gospel produces. This song that we will burst into at the end of chapter 11, where we just praise the amazing mercy of God. Just before we get to that climactic point, we have a series of commands. Uh, do this and don't do this from the Apostle Paul. And these commands and prohibitions are related specifically to how Christians in the church today relate to unbelieving Jews. Very specific situation, very specific applications, very specific directives and these things are near and dear to Paul's heart, and, and they are very serious here. How should we act toward unbelieving Israel? How should we think about Jews who historically had such unbelievable privileged access to God, who have been rejected? Well, as we've seen already, we must remember that God's rejection of Israel is partial, not total. It is temporary and not permanent, and it is purposeful. And in the meantime, while Israel nationally has been rejected, guess what has happened? Gentiles get to enjoy the mercy and favor of God, and they have come in droves. We have come in droves to the mercies of God. How then should we respond to the nation to whom God made promises and to individuals. And to state the principle more generally, those of us who are saved by grace through faith are to be humbled by the mercies of God, not to be entitled by them, not to feel an air of superiority towards others. And this fundamental disposition of the rescued feeling humbled and grateful, we lose it sometimes. And historically, the church or Christendom or Western civilization has lost it in particular in relationship to the nation of Israel. 
And Paul is going to address these things for us this morning in Romans eleven seventeen to 24. And this is an extended metaphor. In verse 16, Paul introduced us to an illustration about root and branches of an olive tree. And verses 17 to 24 is an expansion of that illustration in this extended metaphor to help us understand the mercies of God towards undeserving sinners. And the appropriate response to those mercies is humility. So what we're going to do this morning, part of our introduction will be just to follow the metaphor verse by verse. And then we'll begin our outline this morning, thinking through the features of this metaphor chronologically. And then Paul's specific application points. So just by way of introduction, let's read the text, verses 17 to 24, and then just make some observations through it. Paul writes, if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them and became partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but it is the root that supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right, they were broken off for their unbelief. But you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Behold then the kindness and severity of God. To those who fell, severity, but to you, God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, How much more will those who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? This metaphor that Paul brings forward to humble us by the mercies of God is a metaphor from horticulture, from dealing with plants and trees and things. And if if you want to see how grafting works, I'm going to invite you over to Ken Evans' backyard where he has taken twigs from one citrus tree and put them into the branches of another citrus tree and one fruit grows on another kind of tree. And you can pick up the illustration that Paul is using here to talk about the relationship between Gentiles involved in the redemptive plan of God compared with Jews involved in the redemptive plan of God. Let's follow the metaphor verse by verse for a few moments. Look at verse 17. Let's identify the participants. Verse 17 says, if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive were grafted in among them and became partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree... This is a first section of an if-then statement. Two ifs and a then is coming. The then is don't be arrogant. And both of these ifs are assumed true. These things are true facts and they lead to a conclusion. The participants are these. Some of the branches, do you see that phrase there in verse 17? That is unbelieving Jews. And notice that it's not all Israel. It is some. That is, there is a believing remnant. And the you here in verse 17 are believing Gentiles. He's not saying that all Gentiles go to heaven, but he's addressing specifically you who are believers as Gentiles. The them in verse 17 would be believing Jews. Notice what Paul says. We Gentiles who believe are grafted in among them. That is, we're grafted into the tree along with the branches that are still standing. Right? Those are the believing Jews, the believing remnant, what the Bible refers to as spiritual Israel. That is, Jews who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And we're grafted in among them. Paul says we become fellow partakers with them of the rich root. We are grafted in among those natural branches that are still attached to the tree. The them is believing Jews. And then the root are the patriarchs That is the the founding fathers of Israel, those 
who were idolaters historically. Uh, Babylon, Babylon was the land that Abraham came from, was called out by God, by his grace, believed God in faith, was taken out of his land, out of his world of idolatry, and brought into personal relationship with God by grace. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those founding fathers of the nation of Israel, they're called the patriarchs, and they are the ones to whom the promises were made, the, the promises, the covenants, those unilateral declarations that God would be a blessing to Israel in very specific ways, and then ultimately would be a blessing to the nations of the earth through Israel. That is the rich root of the olive tree described here. And notice that unbelieving Jews were broken off. Uh, to break off here is to separate something from something else by violence or by force. And believing Gentiles were grafted in. And the believing Gentiles are compared to a wild olive tree. That is a, an olive tree out in the wilderness. It just grew there. It wasn't planted there by somebody seeking to get olives. It just grew by itself. Uncultivated, uncared for, untended. It is neglected. It is of bad olive stock. It is scraggly. And it bears bad fruit or no fruit at all. And the Gentiles were grafted in. This is a passive verb, meaning Gentiles did not decide, hey, I'm in the wrong tree. I want to be in that tree. I'm going to go put myself in it. They were grafted in. This is a measure of God's grace. God is the actor doing the work here. This is obviously God's sovereign work to save sinners, which exemplifies or magnifies his mercy. Notice in verse 18, the command is, do not be arrogant. So if branches were broken off and if Gentiles were grafted in, then don't be arrogant. Don't be arrogant toward the branches. Again, the branches are the ones broken off, lying on the ground, separated from the rich root of privileged access to God. They're not being nourished. If you've ever cut limbs off of your tree, they don't survive long. They wither and dry out on the ground. They become dead. And the encouragement here is do not be arrogant toward the branches, the broken off ones, the ones lying on the ground in unbelief, unattached to the rich root, unattached to God's word, unattached to the benefits of access to him. By the way, the engrafted, scraggly, wild olive branches, verse 18, are supported by the richness of the gracious promises of God that came through his people Israel. The reminder that I don't belong in this tree and I don't deserve to be here, I don't deserve God's kindness, these truths will keep us humble toward those who are broken off for unbelief. And notice in verse 19, you will say then, and, and Paul has insight into the human heart, branches were broken off so that I might come in. In other words, God valued me and he needed to make room for me, so he cut out some other people. Uh, this would not be the way to think here. To consider all the trouble that God went to make a place for little old me. I must be some kind of special wild olive branch. You know, Christianity views the cross that way. Our Christian culture says, do you want to see how valuable you are? Look to the cross. That is not what the cross declares. The cross does not say heaven was going to be so lonely and so awful without your specialness. And so to demonstrate how special and wonderful and beautiful and excellent you are, God came to earth as a baby, grew up as a man, and died on a cross. Now what the cross declares is how wretched our condition was how blinding our rebellion was, how offensive to God, infinitely offensive were our crimes, and how hopeless was our state. That the only solution to such problems were that God himself would take on flesh and become our substitute at the cross and actually pay for our sins to rescue us. We were helpless and hopeless and dead, and the cross is our salvation. Our salvation. 
in verse 20, Paul concedes something true about the protest in verse 19. Wait, aren't I special? God made room for me. Uh, True, they were broken off. But they weren't broken off because you were so special. Wild, scraggly olive out in the wilderness, not bearing any good fruit. They were broken off. Why? Because of unbelief. They were broken off for unbelief. They weren't broken off to make room for you. And the reason you stand, Christian, is by faith, humble, clinging belief. I need a savior, and Jesus is the only one I have. I'm a sinner, and I don't belong here, but God, thank you. That's how we stand. Your presence in this tree in which you do not belong, while many of the natural branches are lying there scattered about the ground, is not a reason to boast. It's not a reason to be blissfully content. It rather should provoke holy fear. Why? Verse 21. (laughs) For if the natural branches were broken off for unbelief, listen, Jews thought that they deserved privileged access to God. Perhaps by heredity, perhaps by the merits of so-called good deeds. They thought they were in. And that version of unbelief is an offense to God that we ourselves will be, will be guilty of if we forget our place, if we forget our in, in infinite indebtedness to the mercy of God. What do you think God would do with wild, uncultivated, scraggly outsider branches if they started acting like they deserved to be in the tree? He will not spare you either. Verse 21. And so verse 22, behold the kindness of God, behold the severity of God. Look at these attributes of God. By the way, both are true of God simultaneously. Kindness and severity. Severity to those who fell and kindness to those who continue in humble faith. The severity even comes from a word which means to cut off. And to fall here is to fall into utter ruin. Notice verse 23. Unbelieving Israel can be grafted in again. God is able to do that. And and notice it will only come about through faith. Only when Israel believes the gospel will they be grafted in. That is the condition for national restoration. And verse 24 is simply an argument from the greater to the lesser. If God can do the really hard thing of taking wild, outsider, scraggly olive branches and grafting them into the rich root of the olive tree, how much easier is it for God to take the natural branches and put them back in? And what we find out in Romans 11 is not only can God do that, but God will do that. And so now we're going to start our outline. So walk through the passage, a little bit of an introduction. I want to organize our thoughts around this in terms of a chronology of redemptive history that is laid out. And and Paul's argument is is a bunch of if-then statements, and it kind of goes back and forth. But let's think through this in terms of a big picture to humble our pride, to exalt God's mercy, let's observe the remarkable ways in which God has dealt with undeserving sinners, specifically in relationship to his dealings with Jews and Gentiles. Number one, God removed unbelieving Jews from privileged access to God. God removed unbelieving Jews from privileged access to God. And Israel is seen as an olive tree here in this metaphor. It was a symbol of Israel in Jeremiah 11 and Hosea 14 and came to be a symbol for Israel in post-Old Testament Jewish literature. Olive trees also were very well known throughout the Mediterranean. What Paul is describing here as a metaphor would have been well known to people in his day. And Israel possessed privileged access to God. Do you remember Romans 3? What is the advantage of a Jew? What's the benefit of being in circumcision? Great in every respect. First of all, they were entrusted with the very oracles of God. God spoke 
and God wrote in their language and deposited his word with them. What immense privilege. Paul goes on in Romans 3, 3 to say, what then? If some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? No, absolutely not. Let God be true and every man found a liar. Just Just because some Jews don't believe does not undo God's faithfulness. God will be faithful. God will be true to himself. And that includes true to his purposes and promises. And listen to Romans 9, 4. The Israelites, it is to them that belong the adoption as sons, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple services, and the promises, and of course, Messiah Jesus himself. However, despite all of that privileged access, because of unbelief, God removed Israel from that privileged access. And Jesus said this would happen. Listen to the parable in Matthew 21. Jesus says, there was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a wine press in it, built a tower, rented it out to vine growers, and went on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his slaves to the vine growers to receive his produce. The vine growers took his slaves and they beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Again, he sent another group of slaves larger than the first, and they did the same thing to them. But afterward, he sent his son, saying, they'll respect my son. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and seize his inheritance. And they took him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? Now listen, Jesus is speaking to the religious leadership of Israel in this parable. And they took the bait and answered the question. They said to him, he'll bring those wretches to a wretched end and he will rent out the vineyard to other vine growers and they'll pay him the proceeds at the proper seasons. They're thinking he's just telling a story about crops. He's talking about them and him. It is the religious leadership that's going to take the son and kill him. Jesus says, did you ever read the scriptures? By the way, Jesus is appealing to the very privilege of their access. You had the Bible. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord and it's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people, a people producing the fruit of it. And he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. On whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. Verse 45, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they understood that Jesus was speaking about them. And so the the Jewish people that the Jewish leadership despised, looked down their noses at, condescended towards, and robbed, oppressed, hid God from them, those Jews who simply believe that Jesus is Messiah, they get the privilege that the leaders don't get anymore. And Gentiles... Outsiders who believe in the Jewish Messiah get the privilege of access that the leaders are denied. And so they sought to seize him, verse 46, but they feared the people because the people considered him a prophet. This was specifically directed at the leadership of Israel. Who had more privilege than they? And yet their place was taken away. And it was taken away violently, broken off, In A.D. 70, Titus Vespasian with his army came through and leveled the temple, ending even down to this present day temple sacrifice and any ability for the nation to keep Mosaic law. All taken away, all privilege, all the access. Notice the phrase broken off in Romans 11, verse 17, verse 19, verse 20. Again, this is a, a violent breaking Again, this, is, this metaphor is not intended to press horticultural strategy. 
right? If you're actually going to graft things in, don't snap off the branches, right? There's a, there's a very delicate surgical way to go about grafting. You don't do it this way. This metaphor is depicting something. And the breaking off is a judgment of God against unbelief. Notice verse 20, they were broken off for their unbelief. Complacent privilege, by the way, is the opposite of humble faith. Oh yeah, I'm here. It's just natural for me to be here basking in the grace of God. (laughs) No, it's not. It is completely and totally undeserved. You remember the Pharisee in Luke 18. He stood up and he prayed this to himself. By the way, that, that, that prayer didn't get higher than his own head. He prayed this to himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector over here. And the tax collector was beating his breast saying, God, have mercy on me, the sinner. Only one of those men went home justified. Humble, faith, clinging to God's mercy. Notice verse 21, God did not spare the natural branches. And it is God's severity that is on display in verse 22 for those who fell. Remember, how did they fall? They were broken off for unbelief. And this fall is a fall unto ruin in verse 22. And just remember, individual branches are in view here. Earlier, Paul has said, has Israel fallen so as to never get up? Have they fallen into abject ruin? And the answer to that nationally is no. The answer to that for unbelieving Israelites is yes. Do you understand the difference? There is a national election of Israel by which God will keep his promises. But any individual Jew, Old Testament, church age, in the future will only stand in God's grace by faith. Anyone remaining in unbelief faces the judgment of God. Remember that the national rejection of Israel is partial, is temporary, and it is purposeful. Part of that purpose is seen in the next part of our outline. Not only did God remove unbelieving Jews from privileged access to God, but God also removed undeserving Gentiles into privileged access to God. You recognize that nobody here that is in the grace of God in Jesus Christ was born here. No one was born a Christian. No one was born saved. No one was born in the right family. No one was born in the right tree. We had to be removed We were, as Paul says, a wild olive. We were outside the tended olive grove, uncultivated, wild, scraggly, producing no useful fruit. Strangers to the covenants, we were outsiders and aliens. To be grafted in, verse 17, to be grafted in, verse 19, requires a removal. Requires removal. And listen, the the tree you grew up in felt comfortable natural, enjoyable, until you started to see that it was a slavery and a dead end and darkness and hopelessness. And God, by his grace, cut you out of that tree and brought you into this rich, rooted olive tree, grafted you in. Again, a passive verb. God is the one doing the grafting. And now believing Gentiles have been placed into direct line of blessing from God, the direct line of access to God. And think about this. For us, no temple, right? No court of the Gentiles where you could only get so far, but you couldn't really be inside. No more rite of circumcision or proselyte baptism. You didn't have to become a Jew to be in with God. But now something very remarkable. We are all temples of God, collectively as a church and individually as believers, a temple of the Holy Spirit, that Christ himself dwells in us, the hope of glory. And all believers are priests and saints, direct access to God, no mediator. There's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, and all of us have direct access And we are set apart unto God as a special people. 
and we become partakers. Notice this verse 17. Some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive were grafted in among them and became partakers with them. Partakers with them is all one word, this big compound word. Uh, Together with them partaking. And so we get grafted in alongside believing Jews and draw from the rich root of their heritage. The Jewish scriptures are our book. A Jewish Messiah is our savior. We are supported by this rich root, verses 17 and 18. The promises of grace that God gave through Israel are our support. From the Old Testament scriptures, all written by Jews, to the New Testament apostles, all Jews who believed, the promises, the covenants, the, the promises made by God to Israel, they are all a benefit to us. Think about the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 12. That God would be a blessing by creating a nation, populating that nation, giving them a land, and being a blessing to them, and then causing them to be a blessing to the nations. Embedded in the very beginning is God's plan of redemption, even for Gentiles. Think about the Davidic covenant, where God makes a promise to have a Davidic king reign on the earth and bring about world peace and prosperity in a way that human history has not yet seen. That's Israel's king, David, and the great, 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 great grandson of David who will be installed as king on the earth in the coming kingdom, the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, the new covenant. Deuteronomy 30, Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36 and 7, and many other places describe promises that God has promised to Israel, to the house of Israel and the house of Judah, what has been a divided kingdom, now a scattered people reunited under their king and given new hearts. Well, guess what? Believer in Christ, Gentile, grafted in, you get even now the privilege of benefiting from the spiritual privileges of physical, tangible, and spiritual promises made to Israel. Do do we have a new heart? Are we new creatures from the inside out who love the word of God from the heart by his supernatural work? Absolutely. And yet that is a promise that still stands for national Israel. And we get to participate in spiritual benefits while we await our coming king. And listen, there's even benefit for us in the rich root of the Mosaic Covenant. The other covenants, the Abrahamic, Davidic, and New Covenant, they are unilateral. They're unbreakable because God made promises he will never go back on. The Mosaic Covenant was conditional. If Israel would obey, they get to stay in the land and prosper. If they disobey, they get scattered and cursed. But you and I go back and we read Mosaic Law and uh, just remind you to to go back and listen to Scott's series through Leviticus to help Christians understand what is my relationship to Old Testament laws that don't apply to me directly. And we discover the rich root of even Mosaic Covenant conditional commands have benefit to us. They are our heritage because we have been grafted into this rich root. And so we stand by faith, verse 20. By the way, that means we do not stand by merits. You didn't get in by being really good. You don't stay in by being really good. You got in and you stay in by continuing in faith. Humble, clinging to Jesus, the Messiah, our Savior. Surely by faith in the one who offers life and access and forgiveness through the cross. And so behold, verse 22, the kindness of God. Kindness to those who believe. Kindness if we continue in his kindness. Listen, all of this, all of the the benefits we get as Gentiles by being grafted into the rich root of the olive tree is undeserved privilege and a miracle of grace. Were it not for this kindness, we would still be in the dark, we would still be lost, we would still be outsiders, strangers to the covenants, we would still be scraggly and fruitless. Fruitless. 
And notice how Paul says this in verse 22. God's kindness to you if you continue in his kindness. That is such an interesting way to describe perseverance. Perseverance of the saints. It's a conditional statement. God's kindness is upon you only if you continue in that kindness. Listen, there's a a subtle warning here, or maybe not so subtle. Don't fall away. Don't run away from God's kindness, which is just a really interesting way to couch such a warning. You know what? I'm tired of kindness. I'm going to go somewhere else. Really? To, to, to walk away from Christ is to walk away from everything that is good. It is to walk away from the kindness of God, the undeserved favor of God. It is to walk away from the one who, with open hands, open arms, adopts us as a father in undeserving love and gives us everything freely. We deserve nothing but punishment. And he gives 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 ad infinitum into eternity future. And you want to walk away from that? God's kindness to you if you continue in his kindness. One commentator said, there is no security for those who by their lives show that the grafting process of faith was apparent rather than real. It is possible to think that you're in when you're not. What is the demonstration that you really belong? You make it to the end. You persevere. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. That is a a severe warning. This coin that is going up in the air and spinning over and over, and we're seeing both sides of it in this verse, severity and kindness. They're part of the same package. God will be severe with those who abdicate simple, humble faith. And God will be infinitely generous and kind to those who simply cling, who simply believe. By the way, we can't erase the warning here by appeal to the doctrine of eternal security. Right? This is a doctrine Paul has been laying out in detail. Go back and read Romans 8. Is a believer secure in Christ forever? Yes. If you are saved, are you always saved? Yes. Does the Bible uphold the doctrine of eternal security? Absolutely. In fact, that's why Romans 9 to 11 exists as a section in our Bible to affirm God's unwavering commitment to his promises. But there are also in the Bible, in addition to promises of eternal security, commands to persevere and warnings about falling away. How do these three things work together in our Bibles? I'm just going to give you a little advertisement for an upcoming Equipping Hour class on that topic, where we'll spend a few weeks working through promises of eternal security, the doctrine of biblical assurance commands to persevere and warnings against falling away. How do all these things work together? That's coming. The third point in our outline, God will give undeserving Jews a place of privileged access to God. God removed unbelieving Jews from privileged access. God removed believing Gentiles into privileged access. And there's a day coming when God will give undeserving Jews a place of privileged access to God once again as a nation. Verse 23, and they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. That's another conditional statement where God is saying, if this, then this. And the if part of the statement is assumed true. There's a form in which Paul presents this argument that's saying the first statement is true. And if the first statement is true, the second part of the statement is beyond doubt. And so God is able 
to graft them in again. Another way to say that is God is able to keep his promises. God is able to do that which is frankly impossible. And in, in, the, wor- in the world of horticulture um, is unnatural. right? If you, if you snap off branches from a tree that you like, how easy do you think it's going to be after those branches have, have dried up and withered and shriveled and every leaf has fallen off and they've been trampled on the ground? How easy do you think it would be or how effective do you think it would be to stick that back on the tree? <laughs> while, while it naturally had a place in the tree, it was broken off. And now could it ever be put back on? <laughs> in, in the world of citrus, no, absolutely not. It would not work. But what what has God been doing in all of this? God has been doing the impossible. The dead on the ground, broken off, hopeless branches can be grafted in again. Look at verse 23. They also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in again. And, And the same grammatical structure is in place here. The first part of the argument is assumed true. And so the second part of the argument is not in doubt. Romans 11 continues to unfold, we'll look at this next week, that God will in fact do this. This isn't merely a statement about God's ability. But here, Paul wants to affirm God's ability. Because if you were a Christian in the first century, having watched the nation reject and murder her own Messiah, and then so few Jews coming into the church compared with a burgeoning population of Gentiles. You might think, well, that's over. In fact, the church has thought that organizationally for almost all of its 2,000 years. From the Marcionite heresy, which was personally, racially, philosophically, religiously, and theologically anti Semitic cutting out everything Jewish from their Bibles to Roman Catholicism, which institutionally persecuted Israel as a nation and Jews as individuals. You do know that the yellow star on the armband and the pogroms and moving Jews uh, into segregated neighborhoods was not an invention of Adolf Hitler. There was nothing new in World War II in terms of Europe's treatment of Jews. That was old habit. And it was old habit done under the banner of Christendom. Certainly not endorsed by Scripture. And I, and I, I hope not practiced by believers. But instituted by the church or Christianity as a wayward organization. The church has historically assumed that God is done with Israel. But God is able to fulfill his promises. And as we will see, God will. And and again, this is an argument from the greater to the lesser. If the wild olive branches can be grafted in, how much more natural is it for the natural branches to be grafted in? It's only appropriate that God would keep the promises he made to the people to whom he made them. Our participation is just a remarkable, undeserved blessing. But the way God is doing this is what drives all of Romans to this climactic point in Romans 11 and the outburst in song at the end of the chapter. Because Jews who at one time said, I'm good, I got Abraham as my father. Remember what Jesus said to them? God can raise children of Abraham from stones. (laughs) Your heredity means zilch in terms of your personal accountability before God to believe the gospel. And yet we have these promises in Zechariah 12 and 13, Ezekiel 36 and 37, Jeremiah 31, that God will actually bring about the restoration of Israel. And it is more probable than the inclusion of Gentiles. That's the point of the illustration here. Both of them are impossible. Both of them are accomplished by God. We're going to switch gears a little bit here and move to a different side of the sermon, or maybe sermon number two this morning. New outline, it's up there on the screen for you. To humble our pride and to exalt God's mercy, 
We want to follow Paul's instructions as we observe God's ways. And we'll just look at four commands here in our text. Be humble, remember, fear, and marvel. First of all, be humble. Verse 18 and verse 20 both give a prohibition against pride. Do not be arrogant toward the branches. Verse 20, do not be conceited. This is another conditional statement in verse 18. If you are arrogant, (laughs) remember something. This arrogance is assumed to be true in the human heart. It's assumed by our passage here to be a ready temptation for Gentiles saved by grace. To, to think lofty thoughts, high views of ourselves. Ver, verse 20, the, uh, do not think highly of yourself. Do not be haughty. Do not be conceited. This is arrogance and pride to think self-exalting thoughts like, I must have been a pretty special wild olive branch. How do we think God feels about those who think they deserve access to him? This is a tendency of the human heart to take pride in things we have no right to take credit for and could never bring about. To think that my own significance would be on display by the removal of another. Don't despise the natural branches racially, ethnically, or theologically. Do you find in your own heart a tendency or a temptation to glory over the faults and failures of others? Do other people's tripping up make you feel better about yourself? A strong prohibition here against such thoughts. And God knows our hearts. Whether Paul had something specific in in mind in the hearts of the people in Rome to whom he was writing, he had never been there, or whether he's just expressing insight into the tendencies of the human heart, our own proclivities, this is spot on. We are so quick to pride. And the command here is, be humble. A second is remember. Specifically, remember your roots in verses 17 and 18. Remember our indebtedness to the rich root of the olive tree, which is Israel, and specifically the patriarchs and the promises of God's grace that came through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The covenants, the scriptures. Remember that our Messiah is Jesus of Nazareth, the son of David, the tribe of Judah. And I think there's something important for us to remember in how we read our Bibles. We are to read our Bibles as God wrote them or as God wrote his word, left to right. If you're thinking Hebrew reads right to left, just think English for a moment. From Genesis to Revelation. We read our Bibles not with a New Testament lens through which we now see the Old Testament as it never could have been understood before. But flip that around. We're indebted to the Old Testament. Read your Bible, read your New Testament through the lens of the Old Testament. I'm convinced we don't know our Old Testaments well enough. We tend to think ourselves into passages that we're not in. We tend to try to apply things directly to us that are not about us as if we're the center of the universe. Listen, the church is not the only group of people God has been dealing with in human history. And it's not the only group of people he will deal with in human history. It's the only group of people that we've been a part of. But we shouldn't get that out of proportion or think that something is amiss if we don't see the church in the Old Testament. We need to know our Old Testaments better and read forward. The New Testament, by the way, will become much more clear the better we know the Old Testament and read it in its own right. The third instruction for us from the Apostle Paul is to fear. Verse 20, do not be conceited, but fear. And here, fear is a mark of humility. It's set against conceit. As Tom Schreiner said, fear is the antidote to pride. It it removes any sense of entitlement. And and what is that fear? The fear is, well, if If I succumb to the same temptation that the Jewish leadership had in Jesus' day, 
that I'm here by right or by merit or by my heredity or I've always gone to Grace Bible Church and so God's just got to be happy with me because I sit here. Fear. God did not spare the natural branches. He will not spare you either. Pride is unbecoming in the halls of grace. And pride is inappropriate for those who have been rescued. Pride is also spiritually dangerous. This is the very sin for which the Jews were cut off access to God. Paul says, what do you have, Christian, that you did not receive? In other words, you didn't come up with this stuff on your own. It's been given to you as a grace gift. And if it's been given to you, if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you came up with it all on your own? A fourth command is simply to marvel. Verses 22 to 24, behold, look, check this out. Stop and see this, marvel at it. Marvel at the two-sided coin of God's activities with sinners. Kindness toward those who believe and severity toward those who don't. Listen, God will vindicate his holiness over unbelief and rebellion, over stubbornness and sin. He will have his day. And God will also vindicate his integrity as he keeps his promises to those who believe. How should we look toward unbelieving Jews and and frankly toward all unbelievers of all sorts? Not condescendingly down our noses, but with sorrow, compassion, prayer, hope, and evangelism. How should we view ourselves in relationship to God? Fear, humility, faith, Gratitude. If there's ever a temptation in us to have contempt for the lost, just remember you once were lost in darkest night. Lord, we thank you for these humbling reminders of your mercy. I know it's so good to be humble, it's so sweet to be humbled by these things, to be brought low, to forget ourselves, to be wrapped up in your love. God, forgive us for feeling like it's just natural for us to have access to you. God, let us always remember that we were lost, that we were without hope in the world, strangers to the covenants, we were aliens, we were in fact your enemies. And you brought us into your family, you grafted us into this tree of grace so that your mercy could be lifted up, exalted, and marveled at for all of eternity. We pray to do that even now in song as we close. In Jesus' name, amen.